Hi, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, we're going to begin the presentation in about one minute. We're just going to give everyone a chance to log in. Thanks. Hello, and thank you for joining us for the webinar. Uh, we're just going to give everyone a chance to log in. We'll be starting in one minute. OK. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the webinar on Oracle uh, licensing Oracle on AWS, brought to you by Miro Consulting and Clockwork. My name is Sean Donahue, and I'm the VP of Marketing here at Miro Consulting. And joining me today is Miro's Director of Technical Services, Tim Hegedeff, and Clockwork Principal Consultant, Tom Camaro. If you have any questions during the broadcast, please use the question box in your webinar control panel, uh, and we'll answer them at the end of the session. Uh, please note that if you'd like to ask a question, we won't say who's asking it, but we will read the questions out to the audience and try to answer it the best we can if we, in the time we have. If we can't get to your question, uh, we'll get to you after the session, uh, or if your question is, is, depends on certain things, we have follow-up questions, please feel free to ask them, uh, and we will definitely get to you after the session, if not during. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to explain uh, who Miro is and who Clockwork is. Uh, Miro Consulting is a leading global provider of software asset management and subscription management services for Oracle, Microsoft, IBM, Adobe, and Salesforce. We specialize in license management, audit advisory, negotiation tactics, support management, and cloud services. Our mission is to help our clients maximize ROI on their software license and subscription investments stay in compliance, and negotiate successful contracts and audit settlements. Uh, about Clockwork, um, Clockwork is the preeminent experts in Oracle to AWS migration. Uh, they've been helping enterprises across multiple industries with Oracle migration and managed services for 10 years. Uh, they've been recently acquired by RDX, uh, who is one of the largest independent providers of managed database and cloud services. Uh, they've successfully migrated over 250 Oracle instances to the cloud. Uh, and they are an AWS advanced consulting partner as well as an Oracle Gold partner. And uh, just a quick bit about the technologies that Clockwork supports. Uh, they support Oracle's eBusiness Suites, uh, Business Intelligence or BI, JD Edwards, Oracle Retail, and many of the supporting technologies. Uh, they're also experts in the various SQL servers, Amazon Aurora, Rack, and Sun. Okay, before we begin uh, the presentation itself, we're just going to ask a couple of poll questions here real quick. Uh, and the first here is going to be, uh, what's your current status with Oracle and AWS? Uh, so you can see here we have a couple of answers. So please take a moment and choose what you would, uh, your current st status with Oracle and AWS. and we'll leave the poll open for just another few seconds here to keep the presentation rolling. So if you haven't made your selection by now, please make your selection. All right, last chance to make your selection. All right, thank you very much. And one more, we'd also love to know What's your biggest challenge regarding Oracle and AWS? And we've run across a number of these. So uh, if one of these applies to you, uh, please choose an answer uh, so that we can better plan these webinars for the future and understand your needs and plan accordingly. We'll leave it open for another 10 seconds or so to give everyone a chance to vote. All right, if you have made your selection, please make it now.
All right, thank you very much. All right, with that uh, done, I'd like to turn it over to Tim to begin our presentation. Tim? Thank you very much, Sean, and welcome to our audience. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, we're going to walk you through each area, uh, commonly held beliefs, if you will, uh, but at the conclusion of this part of our presentation, uh, you hopefully will have a baseline knowledge about them. So I hope to fill in some of the blanks for you. Now, the ensuing slides are a little bit busy, um, but they highlight some of the considerations that we feel are important. Um, and this presentation highlights those considerations, uh, but you might still have some questions. So again, we ask you to uh, ask that question down in the question box located in your controls. Um, also, we're not going to really read these slides to you as we consider that to be somewhat insulting. Um, so again, you are encouraged to get those questions uh, submitted and then ultimately answered. Um, this first part of our presentation is essentially the crux of it. Uh, that is, your current environment must be defensible. Uh, as a transition to AWS will neither create nor resolve any compliance issues. But be very aware, Oracle policies can and do change, often without any formal announcement. Uh, and if you are not up to date on these Oracle policies, you can find yourself out of compliance. Um, and that's not necessarily through any fault of Oracle or especially yourselves, but a combination of your deployments versus the Oracle rules. Uh, so knowing your uh, uh, your license position uh, goes going in, it really does afford you the opportunity to implement some of these strategies as part of the transition, very important there, very much as part of the transition. And that can help you mitigate at least some of these issues. Now, a question that is no doubt out there uh, is whether transitioning to AWS can trigger an audit by Oracle. Uh, and the answer is no, not automatically. And while Miro is seeing uh, kind of an uptick in audit activity, uh, a hosted environment, even at AWS or especially at AWS, is not one of the parameters that we're seeing. Now, that said, most companies do have some sort of compliance issue, right? That again, will not be mitigated via the migration, but for which the migration can become the catalyst for mitigating that compliance issue. Now, chances are in fact that your AWS footprint will differ from that uh, which you have on premise. Uh, indeed, some of you might even be thinking that a transition to AWS because you are contemplating a hardware upgrade. So a transition seems uh, at least a part of the consideration. But be aware that AWS is a ginormous enterprise that will provision state-of-the-art servers. Uh, so the likelihood that a different footprint is a very real possibility. And while you would want to be mindful of an audit, right, the reduced footprint could help in that regard, right? It could lessen that exposure. And let's not forget about your network. AWS has architected a very fast uh, data transfer protocol uh, that can also lend itself to an Oracle environment that differs from what you have now. And then we ask you to finally remember that your BYOL licenses, that is bring your own licenses, the ones transitioned from on-premise to AWS are still supported by Oracle. So when a database issue arises, uh, you would follow your existing procedures. Now, on January 23rd, 2017, and again on January 23rd, 2018, uh, Oracle instituted a revised policy concerning 
what it refers to as authorized cloud environments, of which AWS is one. Essentially, it refers to how AWS vCPUs are counted. And the exact language actually appears in the bottom bullet. Uh, but the doubling of licenses is not a given because AWS, as we have just mentioned, utilizes servers that are designed and configured for optimal performance. So your organization may just be able to get by with what you have in terms of license inventory. Right? Oracle knows that. Right? Oracle knows that fact and reflects it in its licensing policies, which addresses computational power versus on-premise platform characteristics. Okay. Now, if your, your organization is uni using an unlimited license agreement or an unlimited uh, or a universal license agreement or a ULA, however you want to refer to it, uh, for its on-premise pro products, uh, you can encounter some very strong headwinds in using those licenses in the cloud. And that's not just an AWS thing. This, because this Oracle has, has uh, adopted a standard in that these licenses can be used in the cloud, virtually any cloud, but their deployment there cannot be counted in the final certification quantity. All right, let me restate that. While you can use the licenses under a ULA in the cloud, you cannot include them in the final count during the certification of that ULA. And uh, can you negotiate this? Certainly. But as with many, many Oracle terms and conditions, um, you would have to have done so prior to inking that deal. Right. So uh, this is a we have we have some precedents for it here at Miro. Uh, but again, it was negotiated pre ULA signing. Right. Now we reach what we sometimes refer to as the blank stare part of our presentation. Right? APIs or application programming interfaces. Miro's experience is, is, is that the person or persons with whom we are interacting either is totally unaware of what the API is or, or how it's used or how they work. Now, the APIs primarily affect Oracle applications and involves uh, a, a situation in which some users, uh, perhaps even the majority of users, do not actually log into the Oracle application. Rather, they benefit from the data housed in the application repository, and therefore, per Oracle, they must be licensed. Right? Now, regardless of whether the Oracle, where the Oracle application lies, on-premise or in AWS or even in another cloud, those rules are exactly the same. Now, essentially, uh, a configuration that involves two different sets of storage with the binaries or the Oracle software, um, which are often referred to as LUNs, right, uh, is considered by Oracle to be a standby environment. And this is because both the primary and the secondary node can be simultaneously active. Now, this is the definition that Oracle would enforce. Uh, regardless of how it is categorized by your or organization internally, by your technical staff. Um, very often uh, in Miro's experience, we find those term that terminology to be uh, exchanged or overlaid uh, or brand new terms being used for the environment. Um, we have to pay attention, though, to how Oracle would define them. Right. And, and like we had said, uh, the transition to AWS provides the opportunity to adjust or to implement uh, your current DR strategy.
right? Now, when we talk about advanced compression, um, we are saying that many organizations would take advantage of that product to perform the data transfer. However, I know that Clockwork does not require advanced compression during the transactions it performs, right? But the danger here is that the use of advanced compression, a licensable option for database enterprise addition, uh, it would be detected during an audit. And without knowing it, that it is being used, right, you can be in for a very unpleasant surprise. Worse, perhaps, is the thinking that advanced compression comes with database enterprise addition. Uh, and it would come with... Uh, with that product as a no charge feature and I can tell you it does not it is a four fee add-on option now we also want to point out that some functions within the Oracle database use components of advanced compression and some of these components trigger a licensing requirement such as heap compression now for more information uh, because this is a very complex topic, we invite you to read through the Miro guide uh, that you see on your screen right there. It's called the Oracle Compliance Risks When Using Advanced Compression Options. And if you'd like a copy of this guide, it's free. Uh, please enter it in the question box or contact us. Now, just like advanced compression, Rack your real application clusters is a four fee database option. Right? Some history here uh, Oracle defines a cluster as a group of independent yet interconnected servers that cooperate as a single system. Right? Now, that is not to be confused with a VMware cluster or a Hyper V cluster. But Oracle has described RAC and its architecture as being quote unquote interconnected. And that involves licensing of every single server in that cluster. Now, that interconnectedness uh, allows for a greater processing power, more alternatives than a traditional one to one database architecture. And that, of course, holds some value, which explains why Oracle will make it and has made it a chargeable for fee option. Right. That and the fact that uh, the data must necessarily reside on all nodes. Um, and because of that, rack becomes a for fee option and must be licensed on every part of the cluster. Now. Many rack clusters are within the same data center, um, but they can be extended across uh, to different buildings, different cities, even different geographies. Um, although there would be some, perhaps some networking considerations. So it would be possible to have one node of the cluster on premise, as an example, and have another located at AWS. But all of that, might be for naught, right? Oracle's policy is that Oracle Rack is not listed as part of the Oracle programs that are eligible for authorized cloud environments of which both AWS and Microsoft Azure are part. It goes on to state that as a licensing restriction currently restricts the use of Oracle Rack in either Amazon's AWS or Microsoft's Windows Azure or any third party cloud provider for that matter. Oracle has ceased, and I'm quoting here, Oracle has ceased any supportability evaluation of third party clouds for Oracle Rack in general. Now, you can possibly still use Rack as part of your Oracle Technology Network or OTN agreement. But per Oracle, right, you will want to use the programs for your application uh, for only that purpose and for any purpose that is expressly permitted under this agreement, which, among other things, means there is no support, right? 
but you must obtain from Oracle uh, or an Oracle reseller a valid program license under a separate agreement permitting such use. All right, and I'm going to tell you that that will be a very difficult conversation to have because Oracle simply has stated that RAC is not supported outside of the on-premise deployment. So uh, getting them to support it uh, might not necessarily result in your favor. Now, uh, most applications uh, in the uh, Oracle eBusiness suite environment are referred to uh, in terms of licensing as what is called business metrics. Um, these would include things like application user, uh, millions of dollars of cost of goods sold, um, and these do not rely on the hardware configuration of the server or servers on which they're deployed. As an example, we uh, choose to use financials, which is listed under the application user metric. Now, there's something called the application licensing table. Uh, the applications that Oracle devises and, and promotes are users of the Internet Application Server and or WebLogic and the Database Enterprise Edition as their data repository, right? Uh, that application licensing table dictates when the licensing is required for those particular underlying products, which are technology products, and which are influenced by the hardware configuration on which they are deployed, right? Um, in Miro's experience, it's mostly on the application side, but increasingly on the database side as well. So now, regardless of where the tester development environment is housed, the ref refreshment, refreshing of data, right, typically from production, um, must include some level of disabling or deleting of the unused accounts, right? Otherwise, uh, a non-compliance uh, uh, situation could exist. This is a uh, uh, a matter of what we refer to as account cleansing. Um, it's a very, very important part of the uh, that refreshment schedule, that refreshment protocol, and we can cite currently that there are uh, uh, organizations, clients of Miro, who are uh, struggling with that particular aspect during audits. Uh, in fact, they have not. Uh, the clients I'm thinking of have not enforced any sort of account, account cleansing, and therefore uh, they have to license these underlying technology programs uh, in, in as they would production, that is with CPU versus uh, n named user plus or NUP licenses, right? Um, it's also uh, important to keep in mind that any potential on-premise compliance issues can be addressed during that migration. Now, there's one other aspect uh, for EBS. Um, Oracle has waived the extended support fees uh, for 11.2 uh, and 12.1, uh, but only where they are in support of the e-business programs. So um, the, the, your question of what does that mean? <laughs> well, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I will simply point you to our own website, which has a blog on this very topic, right? So. Migrating to AWS is certainly an approach you want to take. Um, you can certainly consider it. Clockworks can certainly get you there. Uh, and you will want to be aware of any of these licensing implications as a result of that decision and prepare for it. With that, I'll turn it back over to Sean, uh, who will introduce our next speaker. Sean? All right, thank you very much, Tim. And if you had any questions on uh, what Tim presented, 
uh, please feel free to put them in the question box in your webinar control panel. And with that, I want to hand it over to Tom Camaro, uh, Principal Consultant at Clockwork. Tom? Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone. Uh, as uh, my predecessor announced, uh, I hope you're all doing well today. Uh, as I mentioned, I am with Clockwork, and uh, our focus is on moving Oracle workloads into Amazon. So I want to talk to you a little bit about how we do that and cover some of the things, uh, maybe uh, some of the real life examples of some of the things that Tim mentioned around rack and uh, CPU counts, et cetera. Um, you know, first an item that, that should be brought up is, is how we typically migrate Oracle into AWS. Frankly, it's not all that different than migrating uh, Oracle into any other data center, um, actually very similar to probably some of the cloning processes that you use. Uh, there are a little bit of, uh, there are some tweaks for Amazon. Uh, Amazon offers uh, Snowball, that's their uh, NAS drive. Um, you know, you have to buy their version uh, to uh, load the data and ship it in. Uh, we typically, uh, assuming that the, the platforms are center, similar, Linux to Linux, Windows to Windows, uh, we would um, call for a data transfer and then we would set up DataGuard to do log shipping from your source into AWS so that we have a replica, uh, replica copy of your, your instance running. Then we can run our clones from that. Uh, there are tools such as Amazon's uh, DMS, Database Migration Service, or uh, the Oracle Golden Gate product that would let you do a logical sync. So if for some reason uh, log shipping is unavailable, or in the case where you might have uh, a platform migration from say a Unix platform over to Linux or, or Windows, you would ha uh, have the potential to use these tools to logically sync up data as well. Um, we do quite a bit of that. We see a lot of people now coming off of uh, Solaris a uh, and AIX and moving over to um, Linux on uh, AWS to avoid hardware spend. Um, and that's something, as I said, we're doing quite a bit of. A uh, couple of things to note on Amazon. Um, as we noted, the, the hardware is better over there. Um, well, I, I say better. That's a subjective term. But in our experience, we found that they are running pretty, well, pretty much top-notch hardware. Uh, it's uh, high clock speeds. Uh, they also are all SSD storage, and that's without even considering what they call provisioned IOPS. So standard storage from them is all uh, SSD, uh, which we find to be comparable or faster than most um, SAN arrays that people have on premise, even ones that are uh, flash or uh, SSD based. Um, you also have the ability to provision IOPS. So if you do have a workload that is particularly IO sensitive, we can uh, provision tens of thousands of IOPS to the job uh, through AWS. So we've been able to meet just about every, uh, every need we had for IO uh, with just standard SSD. Um, that includes EBS instances. And only a few times have we had to uh, fall over to some level of provisioned IOPS. Um, we typically spec out when we look at a workload, we'll take a look at your AWR reports, we'll take a look at uh, the profile of what you're running today, and we typically find that we can size uh, to half or less of what you have on premise and run at comparable speeds. Um, you know, obviously your, your mileage may vary a little, but this is, is where we start and we find most people uh, work within this area. This slots well with Oracle's uh, licensing change where they effectively cut in half how many Amazon processors they will let you use for the same amount of core licenses and we find it's a it's, it's a wash. Um, we also migrate you know when we migrate we don't just migrate the app uh, the databases we can migrate the applications along with it. Uh, EBS for instance we migrate all of the apps tech stack, WebLogic, SOA, uh, if you've got old IAS, we can do that as well. All of that is part of the migration up into uh, Amazon. So uh, all of that, just so you know, winds up going into EC2 instances. Um, in the case of like uh, Amazon, excuse me, Oracle, EBS, that also is going to go into EC2 because of some limitations on uh, technology that, that Oracle requires uh, the hardware access that uh, you can't get from some of the other Amazon services. Next slide, please. Um, one of the areas that people ask about, one of the things we find we can optimize highly is how you do backups and disaster recovery on AWS. Most of you are used to, I'm sure, doing RMAN uh, and storing a catalog somewhere and keeping large copies of this. 
one of the things we've been able to do at AWS is um, take advantage of some of their, I'll call them cloud native technology, specifically the snapshot technology. We have the ability to snapshot a volume and that snapshot's made available across multiple availability zones within the region. So effectively, you have a server in one data center, you take a snapshot, the copy is available shortly thereafter in each of the other data centers in that region. Uh, where this becomes handy is you no longer have to uh, set up, for instance, a data guard copy to another location just to get the data over there. You already have it. Um, it also makes for quick spooling up because these are all software defined uh, resources. I can very quickly spool up uh, new servers in a surviving availability zone in the case of, of a disaster uh, and bring them exactly back up to the spec they were, attach the, uh, the snapped volumes and be back up and running in a very short time frame. Uh, just in case you are wondering, when we take these snapshots, we're not snapshotting the live transactional database. We, use, we still use our man. We, we still capture local backups into a fast recovery area and we take our snapshot from that. Um, all of this means that in effect, we can eliminate the need for uh, a disaster recovery instance. We find that we can recover within most people's RPOs, RTOs. If you've got a one minute RPO and a five minute RTO, we might need to have further discussion, but typically in the, the one to four, you know one hour RPO, four hour RTO range, um, and you know usually quicker than that, we can get these things stood back up. Um, Anyway, that's just a way that you can uh, save a lot of licensing. And as uh, Tim mentioned earlier, Oracle is very good at um, getting you to pay for a DR copy, even if you don't think you need it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask you for the next slide. All righty. Rack is another item where we find we can make great advances and great savings on people's license uh, postures. Um, what we like to say that Rack is a solution, not a requirement. Uh, and when we find folks that have Rack, we want to dig down to why are you using Rack? Are you using Rack because you have so much load that you need two or three servers to handle, handle it all? Are you using it because you have an IO bottleneck? Are you using it because you want the ability for one of them to go down and the other one to take over uh, you know, in, a, in a high availability mode? what is the reason you're, you're using Rack? And we find we can solve most of those uh, within AWS without implementing Rack. Um, for example, if you have a lot of compute power, we can specify larger uh, instance sizes in AWS with more compute power to take over the load. I already mentioned that you know, we use half as many CPUs in general. If you've got a two node Rack, okay, we can double the size of the instance and usually get you back what you had from Rack. Um, if you need it for fault tolerance, this is one where we can't give you the exact capability of you have one instance and it transparently fails over to the second. But if you think about how Rack is normally implemented, there's usually a, an application hiccup in the way anyway. We rely on the reliability of the AWS infrastructure. Um, you know, these, the instances that they give are available. They're at 11 nines of availability or whatever they happen to be these days. Maybe they've, they've increased the number of nines. And that we find is more than enough. I'll be honest, my own personal experience, I ran Rack for many years and I found I had more outages caused by Rack panics and Rack sync issues than I had in any of my standalone instances. So uh, in a way that multi-node for failover can be you know, the, the, the uh, solution can be worse than the problem. Um, anyway, this, by eliminating Rack, you, you get two advantages. One, you don't have to pay for your Rack licenses. And if we don't need to duplicate the database, if you're just looking for, say, an availability uh, or, or scalability uh, alternative, we can eliminate some of the database licenses as well. Next slide, please. Oop, looks like we missed one. Okay, um, on the cloning side of things, uh, this gets back to snapshotting from an Oracle point of view. We can use the database clones very much like you probably use snapshots in your own disk systems to very quickly spawn off new instances. Um, and because these snapshots are always catching the deltas, I can always bring it back to a certain point in time and uh, recover that database. Um, 
you know, we made some mention in here about being able to spin up clones as we want. We also have the ability to uh, auto scale. If you have application servers that uh, need to grow or shrink under load, you can set up auto scale groups in AWS. We can set up the uh, the servers uh, and you know usually set up a a combination of the auto scale group and scripting so that under load you will get more application servers um, uh, to support your need. Um, let's see what else do we want to cover there. Um, one of the, the, the bottom bullet here I did want to bring up, I've had this question from several customers where they have seasonality in their, uh, in their work or, or periodicity where under certain times of the month, certain times of the year, they really get a significant increase in load. Uh, it is possible with AWS, because this is all virtual, you may scale up and scale down the size of your database. Obviously, there's an outage necessary to change that level of hardware. And the one comment I would made is, make is that by doing that, you do have to consider the fact that you need to license for whatever your high water mark is. You don't want to um, scale up, you know, run four, C, four cores at one point, scale up to 16 for your load, scale back down to four and try and tell Oracle that you're only using four. They are smarter than that. They will catch you. We don't recommend that at all. But if you have the need for that scale up, you purchase the licensing for the scale up, it is absolutely something that, that we've got customers doing, you know, where they will uh, set a maintenance window Go ahead and scale up their instance, use it for a month during their peak period, and then turn it back down. That what that does is it saves you on the hardware cost of AWS, not necessarily the Oracle licensing. Next slide, please. Okay, um, just to give you an idea about some of the customers we've worked with, um, you know, uh, uh, we can work a number of different ways. Uh, Clockwork works independently, so we can be um, an AWS certified partner. You, know, you go to AWS and we're often recommended to customers directly from AWS. Uh, in that capacity, we worked with um, you know, a large multinational services company. They do auto glass and you may uh, be aware of their US component that has a very catchy jingle, um, but we have moved their entire EBS. And in fact, in that case, we moved an EBS from premise up to Amazon, all instances in less than five weeks. Um, we are currently working with some of their subsidiaries on moving other Oracle workloads uh, off of, in this case, AIX and other uh, platforms. Um, we also have worked with uh, one of the major uh, grocery retailers in the UK um, and taken their entire online shopping experience and moved it up to the web. Um, one of the things that they found after implementing, after we put them up, the performance on less hardware. So we implemented them on roughly half or less of the hardware spec that they had on site. Uh, the system was running so fast under their new platform that they got uh, different metrics on cart abandonment. People had been abandoning carts uh, because of slow uh, user experience under the old system and they were able to see very clearly a significant drop in abandoned carts because the responsiveness of the system was much higher and people were able to complete their online shopping experience. Uh, and that was all with, as I said, less than half of the hardware in AWS than what they had on premise. From a pro services point of view, we can partner with AWS pro services. So if you have a pro services engagement and want to just have one throat to choke, we can uh, do that as well. We often work as a sub to them. Um, we have, for instance, done work with several large banks, so one of them's here in New York City, um, and uh, the UK government. I can't say too much more about that one. Um, we also can partner under any global service providers you might have. So if you already have a partner, we've worked with folks like Slalom and HCL um, to deliver the Amazon piece of what we're doing. Um, again, those last two kind of give you the one throat to choke option. Next slide. Okay, with that, I think we're at the end. I, uh, I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to Sean for uh, closure. All right, so thank you very much, Tom. It was a great presentation. I'm sure the audience found it very uh, helpful. Uh, before we get to the question and answer phase, I just wanna give Tim an opportunity to quickly touch on a Miro success story to give you an idea of uh, the kind of work we do. Tim? Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, 
you know, Miro has had a number of very successful clients uh, transition uh, to AWS as a uh, as a rule. Uh, one that stands out is a global computer printer and technology company who actually remains a uh, client, as do uh, some of the other, most of the others, um, to this day. Uh, their migration of their Oracle technology and applications to AWS began some three years ago. Um, a couple of our other clients include a mid-sized tool uh, and uh, rental center and provider. Um, he uh, he refers to himself as the uh, as as one of the foremost uh, uh, groups within that particular vertical. And speaking of foremost. Uh, Another gentleman who refers to himself as the foremost supplier of replacement components um, is also a client. And in the case of the former, the uh, the transition involved the consolidation of various offices around the world into a more coherent, uh, more globalized environment. And in the case of the latter, uh, this transition, which is currently ongoing, uh, involves uh, using AWS for backup purposes. So uh, in all of these cases, uh, the Miro support network or our retainer service is able to provide these organizations with the guidance that is necessary to, uh, to better understand the complexities involved with Oracle licensing within the AWS world and to make uh, some informed decisions concerning deployment there. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Sean for our first question. All right, thanks, Tim. Uh, I just want to get a couple of house cleaning questions uh, off the uh, out of the way here. Yes, we will be sending a recording of the webinar to everyone who registered, uh, and uh, we will also be sending the advanced compression white paper to those of you who had, who had asked. Uh, I want to get the first two questions out of the way quickly. Uh, someone had asked about uh, what are the backup options for Oracle and AWS, and I think uh, Tom covered that pretty well when he went through his. Uh, slides around storage. If you have further questions, uh, please just let us know via email and we'll help you out. Uh, the second question that came in uh, was asking for a comparison of standard uh, versus enterprise edition licenses uh, on AWS and with or without the hyper-threading. Uh, to the person who asked that question, and just for everyone else, we're going to send a link around at the uh, after presentation that is the Oracle white paper on that uh, licensing question, uh, as well as uh, we wanted you to know that hyper-threading will be on uh, with an EC, EC2 instance running in AWS. However, you can turn it off uh, at the OS layer. Uh, so I'm going to do my first my first question we've had live come in uh, since I've been speaking here. Uh, person says, I am moving from on-premise servers to AWS. I'm trying to calculate license changes, and Oracle is telling me I cannot use my existing licenses, which I've had for years, uh, and that I have to buy termed licenses for use on the web. Uh, what does this mean? Is this a reality? Uh, Tim, can you answer that one for us? Uh, well, I can sure try. Um, I think the answer to the question is is perhaps. Um, and it really comes down to the idea of what's called proprietary hosting or prop hosting. Um, Oracle, as a rule, disallows the, the deployment of its software on any place other than on-premise or within the Oracle cloud if it is in if it is in fact covered by this on uh, this proprietary hosting restriction. Now, if that client, having said that, let me tell you that if that client does not have uh, any prop hosting license in, in place, then there is a non-compliance issue, uh, even if the deployment is on premise or within Oracle, right? So, um, in this case, I'm, re I'm referring to the uh, for use on the web uh, perspective uh, or the language in the email. And then there is the ULA, which I mentioned before, right? Uh, unless previously negotiated, uh, the cloud-based deployments cannot be counted towards the license quantity during uh, any sort of certification. So, so rather than calling it, uh, uh, you know, fear or uncertainty, uh, we might consider that Oracle is simply not articulating any of these facts. Um, if, if termed 
licenses, again, from the language within the question, uh, refers to a licensing term, uh, which is generally one year to five years, um, then we must assume that there is some inaccuracy in the Oracle statement because there really is no difference between um, the, that software uh, licensed under a term license and that software licensed under perpetual license. So uh, it, it really is that a term license is, is simply a, uh, a licensing construct. So um, I, I think that the question is a good question, but some additional context may be necessary. Thanks, Tim. And that's, that, that happens a lot with questions like this. It comes down to, you know, what are your individual contracts say? What is your individual goal? A lot of times we find ways of uh, getting you your goal, just not using the exact licensing scenarios that you might be looking at. So we'll follow up with you after the presentation and see if we can help more. All right, my next question, uh, and I'm not sure which side would answer this. Uh, can you implement Oracle on AWS with standard edition licensing? Uh, I think that's probably better for clockwork. Can you, uh, Tom, can you answer that? Um, and the answer is yes, you can. Um, the Well, first of all, if you're using something like Oracle RDS, uh, Amazon will actually sell you uh, standard edition licensing in, in what they call a license included model. That can be very handy for people who don't want to go and, and deal with buying it from Oracle. Um, you can also install the standard edition. Uh, of course, the same restrictions on a number of, of cores and total CPUs um, that you would have on premise apply with the standard edition, you know, whichever one you're, you're picking up the SE1, SE2 uh, on AWS. Um, essentially with EC2, you're given a computer and you can install on it just about anything you can install remote, you can install software on. All right, Back. thanks Tom. Uh, the next question is, uh, currently we, we are entitled to X number of database licenses. To move our databases to AWS or Azure, uh, and I'll remind you this is about AWS here, uh, do we need to double it, uh, that number of licenses? And I can answer that just very quickly. Uh, and the answer is probably not. And the reason is, is you're going to, you're almost certainly not going to replicate your existing environment uh, exactly as it is, uh, as we might have mentioned earlier. Uh, the AWS servers are different than Oracle servers. You might not need as many, and you might change your configuration in more ways than that. Uh, so assuming you just need double uh, is definitely not going to be the way to go. Uh, the best scenario there is to have organizations like Miro or Clockwork uh, look at your, uh, your environment uh, and evaluate what could really be done there. Uh, so definitely do not take it as you're definitely going to need two, two times as many. Uh, that almost certainly won't be the case. Let me keep going to our next question. Um, I believe this would be better for clockwork. Could you elaborate a little more? Uh, Oracle does not support the use of RAC. Sure. So on AWS. Um, yep. So Oracle has has come out and said RAC is not supported on AWS. Um, the best I can say there is that this is a marketing limitation. Um, they they do not want people running rack uh, i'll be honest we have we have technically been able to set it up and use it on aws um, but uh, a lot of for a lot of people and i would not recommend trying to run it unsupported by oracle uh, you know i would never recommend running a, a production workload or an enterprise workload without the benefit of oracle support so really it just comes down to oracle has said they won't support it they've announced it and because they won't support it um, we don't recommend using it because uh, you know, that leaves you open. If something goes wrong, you know, with the rack, there's nothing you can, you can't go back to them for any kind of help. Does that answer the question? Uh, if it doesn't, I will ask that person to please okay. uh, contact uh, one of our teams after the uh, webinar here, and we can get into further detail with you. Uh, the next question is, uh, how is the DB concurrent device licensing addressed in cloud, uh, Oracle OCI and non-Oracle public cloud? Tom, do you have any, do you want to answer that one or do you want us to take it? I, I have to say, I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you repeat that again? And, and we may have to take that one offline. Sure. 
Yeah, so unfortunately, I think this is a, um, it wasn't written uh, by a native English speaker, but I believe they're asking, uh, how is DB concurrent device licensing addressed in the cloud? I think I, I might be able to take that one uh, uh, from you. Uh, the concurrent device license is a very old metric uh, used by Oracle uh, way back in, uh, geez, over 20 years ago. Um, so uh, the licensing uh, would be uh, need to be converted uh, to a uh, to a current metric uh, using the standard Oracle conversion or, or transition uh, metric or matrix. So um, uh, they couldn't uh, the, the use of concurrent device licenses uh, could not be used. Uh, at uh, at AEWS as is, uh, without uh, any special pre-negotiation having occurred. All right, thanks. And uh, the next question, I think I know the answer to this one. Uh, if we're not using an Oracle product, do we have the option to sell it back to Oracle or a third party? And I'm pretty sure the answer to that one is just no. Uh, Tim, can you confirm that's a, uh, a big no? <laughs> that is a big no. Um, you know there is a, uh, a there is a, a a situation in in which uh you might be able to negotiate with uh, oracle uh for a uh what I'll call a trade in uh used licenses for unused licenses but there is so much in your way again it's not an easy conversation to have um suffice it to say that uh, any sort of uh, concession granted by Oracle would have to f uh, favor them or at least be neutral. Um, and, and secondly, um, you have a number of rules uh, that Oracle has put in place. Most uh, most applicable to this particular issue is the idea of uh, a matching set rule. Um, unlike Microsoft or perhaps some other vendors, uh, Oracle does not allow for a portion of uh, a particular code set to be uh, to be supported, uh, it's either all or nothing at all. So, what is a code set? A code set, for example, is all versions of Database Enterprise Edition plus all its management packs, or all editions of WebLogic. So, the idea is that um, if you if you choose not to use it you still have to support it uh, oracle is very very protective of the revenue stream generated by their support services and uh, uh, if you are not using any licenses which is principally uh, the case for many of our clients uh, you have no choice really but to uh, to either bite the bullet or possibly have a very difficult conversation with oracle Tim. Uh, next question, I think would probably best for a Clockworks team to answer this. Uh, are you seeing any trending of migration from Oracle to open source like Aurora, Post, uh, Postgres SQL? Sorry, I can't probably mispronounce that. Uh, instead of just rehosting Oracle on AWS, are vendors supporting AWS solutions more uh, now for purchased packages? Tom? Um, I would say absolutely yes. We are seeing um, first of all, third-party packages are offering more support for MySQL and Postgres, uh, with some of them, including uh, Oracle's own PeopleSoft, uh, supporting uh, Aurora. Uh, you know, you can actually pick a version of Aurora uh, if you're on the latest versions of PeopleSoft, and they will install right onto it. Um, we also find a lot of people, because of licensing, looking at what we're calling what we call refactoring, what you call refactoring, which is can I take my Oracle data, can I take my application and move it over to uh, MySQL or, or Postgres tends to be the better fit. Um, Amazon definitely has tools to help with this. There's something called the schema conversion tool uh, that goes along with the database migration service. So if you have Amazon access, go into your, your console and look up SCT or schema conversion tool. It's a tool you can download, run an assessment against your current database and it will uh, give you an idea of what the change or the impact would be 
to go to other platforms. And we're seeing a lot of people go that way. Now, I won't say that is um, trivial. If you're working with an Oracle packaged product like an EBS or an OBIE, uh, there's, there's really no way to do that. Uh, is that PeopleSoft's kind of the notable exception. Um, but if you have in-house or third-party products, third-party, definitely check with them for support um, on the open source databases. And in-house, uh, it's definitely worth checking. And, and we have a practice that can do that as well to can help you with, with migrating that. But absolutely seeing people going that way simply because of um, license costs and license confusion. Thanks, Tom. Uh, that, that's going to, we're going to wrap it up uh, for the day here. If we did not get to your question, I know there's quite a few we did not get to. It is because uh, the answer is it depends on many things in your environment or it's simply just too large of a discussion to sort of have on the webinar. But I don't want anyone to worry. Uh, if you had asked a question and we didn't get to it, we will contact you after the event. Uh, if you ask for the free guide, we will definitely send that and some other materials. You'll also get a video link to this webinar's recording when it is done being processed. Uh, so I want to say if you have any further questions uh, about your licensing uh, needs, please contact Miro Consulting at info at miroconsulting.com uh, at 732-738-8511, extension 1208, or on the web at miroconsulting.com. Uh, if you have any technical or migration type questions, uh, please contact Clockwork uh, at sales.team at clockwork.com. And please take a look there on your screen so you get the correct spelling of Clockwork. Uh, so that concludes today's webinar. Again, if you have any further questions, please contact these addresses. Thank you very much. Have a great day.